Hi everyone and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about early intervention and prevention and its significance for young people when it comes to complex emotional needs associated with the diagnosis of personality disorder. This is as a part of Taylor Three Cities Goes Global 2022, which is hosting events throughout May across Manchester, Birmingham, London and beyond in the wider world. The events taking place during International BPD Awareness Month aim to explore and bring change for young people with needs associated with the diagnosis of personality disorder. My name is Maddie Kreese. I work for the Anna Freud National Center for Children and Families. Just in just a moment, I'm going to ask Peter and Carla to introduce themselves. But first, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So as I said, I'm Maddie. I work for the Anna Freud Center with the participation team as a lived experience practitioner. My role is as a participation programme assistant. I mainly work on events and trainings and developing new services. Um, this video is, as I said, a part of Taylor Three Cities. And as part of that, I will be hosting also a creative event for young people to share artwork and poetry at the Anna Freud Centre, um, which is on the 18th of May. So, Peter, if I could ask you to introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Maddie, and uh, thank you for all that you do uh, for us here at the centre. Um, very pleased to be joining you in this particular venture. I'm Peter Fonagy, and uh, I am uh, Chief Executive of the Anna Freud Centre, clinical psychologist by training, and uh, uh, a uh, great admirer of uh, my colleague, Carla Sharp. I think that's my cue to introduce myself, Maddie. <laughs> well, just a huge thank you, Maddie, for uh, including me in this conversation. I'm just delighted to talk with you, uh, whom I don't know very well, um, but of course, Peter, whom I do know very well and, and admire um, in return, and, uh, um, and who has been a mentor to me over, over more than a decade now. So great to be here with you. Um, I'm a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Houston. Um, in Texas in the United States and um, I have been very interested uh, over the last 10 plus years in the developmental aspects of personality functioning and personality disorder. Um, highly invested in prevention and early intervention of personality disorder um, I was one of the co-founding members of the Global Alliance for the Prevention and Early Intervention for Borderline Personality Disorder. And so this is a group of people that Peter is very involved in as well, um, that's international across um, most continents, to try and move the needle on early intervention and prevention uh, for young people. So I'm just really pleased to, to, to talk about this particular topic with you today. So thank you for organizing it. Thank you both for attending. Um, so as you've mentioned, our topic is early intervention and prevention for today's um, discussion. I personally think it's a really interesting topic because as someone who's got lived experience of mental health, um, perhaps I feel that I wasn't supported enough early enough or in the right ways. Um, and while I can't imagine not having gone down the path that I kind of that, that my life has taken me on, I know that I would have probably had a much easier time, especially in my teenage years, if I'd have been supported more appropriately and more more quickly. Um, so I think my first question is, how would you describe the importance of early intervention and prevention? So maybe we could frame it as, if you were talking to a parent who had some worries about their child's well-being and you were able to offer some support, how would you explain the significance of getting support for their child now? And maybe I could start with you, Carla. Sure. So, yes, I think, um, you know, our data shows, but also our clinical experience that when a young person and a family come to the clinic around age 11 or 12, by that time, the family had probably already been seeing mental health professionals from age five or six or seven. Um, so young people who end up um, developing personality disorder in their teens have had problems before the teenage years. And so what we find, at least in our clinic, is that and, and when we were, Peter and I were at the Menninger Clinic at the Adolescent Treatment Program over there, um, often uh, young people who 
our uh, you know meeting criteria for personality disorder in in adolescents you know struggled with some uh, form of internalizing problems so anxiety you know um, you know feelings of um, being anxious at school feelings of um, just not being able to to fit in at school very early on um, some young people by that time have had issues of uh, attention, deficit hyperactivity disorder. So they would have impulsivity issues um, and they've been seeing mental health professionals for a while. And so by the time they get to us in adolescence at about 11 or 12, um, they are um, worried and the parents are um, you know, saying, you know, we've been in and out of mental health services for, for a while now and we can't seem to understand what's, what's going on. Um, and, um, you know, if we do assess a young person at that point and we think that there may be um, personality difficulties, um, and with that I mean um, problems in managing the self in the context of interpersonal relationships, that's really what, how we consider personality. Um, if we see that there's that additional dimension on top of anxiety, mood problems, impulsivity, then, uh, you know, we, I usually say to parents, um, this is a time, a critical time for your child to be supported, because what your child will be doing now in the next five, five to 10 years, really, and I always say to parents, it's from 12 to 25, you know, and what your, what your child will be doing between 12 and 25 is really building who they are as a person. So up until that point, you know, if we look back at personality development and how personality develops, you know, we all vary on on, on our, our, our trait manifestation. So some of us are more impulsive than others. Some of us are more emotional than others. And we're born in that way. You know, some babies are harder to soothe. Others are, are easier to soothe. Some babies are approach babies. Some babies are withdrawal babies. You know, so all of us are born with those temperamental traits. But then when we get to adolescence, we do the work of putting putting together and interpreting those traits and making sense of those traits and putting them all together in a coherent sense of self. And so what I say to parents is, I'm so glad you came now at age 12 and 13, because this is the exact time when your child is going to build her personality. She's now putting together who she is as a person. She's doing that hard work. Before that time, she didn't have the metacognitive capacity to do that, but she's now doing it. So everything's in flux right now. And now she needs your support and she needs our support. And we're going to work together as a team to start building her, you know, and, and helping her bind her personality into a coherent sense of self because that sense of self becomes the rudder, the sort of steering wheel, if you will, of the decisions that she's going to make as she begins to launch as an independent young adult. So that's what I try and tell parents, you know, I, I kind of congratulate them for coming at the exact right time. Um, before, before adolescence, we can't really think about it in personality disorder terms in, in that way because the, the, that, co the, that, that ability to put the pieces of the puzzle together in a coherent sense of self hasn't come online yet. And so that's what I say to, to, to parents. I, I'm curious to hear what, what, what Peter says. Um, shall I go, Maddie? Yeah, or... Absolutely, go for it. Go for it. Okay, well, I, of course, um, as I usually do, uh, I agree with uh, Carla very much. Um, we can, I think, maybe later on in the discussion, consider whether we couldn't intervene earlier um in uh some of the uh perhaps uh some of the uh what we now understand are uh, antecedents uh if you like of uh, um, uh personality uh, difficulties but i do agree that adolescent is a, a critical time in this period between 11 and maybe 16 uh, is a very, very important time to, to do something. Um, uh, 
Well, in my clinical experience, uh, uh, what, what um, uh, seems to happen is that um, things that uh, young people could just kind of set aside up to that point, suddenly hit them with a force that's really very difficult uh, to resist. So a sense of excessive self-criticism, a feeling of uh, uh, being empty, um, a feeling of being lost with our aspirations, with our goals, uh, not unlike others around them, they don't really feel they have things they believe in, they have values. Um, uh, they get more confused by what's all the complexity that goes on around them in terms of how other people are behaving, why they're doing things, and they frequently put feet wrong, you know, they put both their feet uh, in things and they can't establish the kind of social network that would adequately support them. Um, but they even more um, uh, vulnerable actually to feeling um, uh, rejected, hurt, bullied, uh, slighted and, and so on. Um, so um, it's uh, a, a good time to engage with them and to say, to their parents and them, you know, at the moment, there are all kinds of life problems um, that uh, uh, your child or to the child, and I would, you know, would want always, to, if I can, to talk to both of them. There are all kinds of life problems that, that you're experiencing, uh, which, you know, which I think it'd be really good uh, if you had somebody working alongside you, uh, and, and develop the, the skills, the, the um, capacity to deal with better than you do. Because if uh, we let this go on in, in the rather negative way that it's happening for you, perhaps at the moment, that's why you came here, it, it becomes, it'll just be more difficult. Um, and if we can do something about this now, um, then uh, maybe uh, we can, uh, stop it getting uh, worse and maybe uh, we can just sidestep it and, and uh, uh, create a, a life and an identity and a feeling about yourself and for yourself that you uh, admire, you feel uh, 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 better about, you feel more compassionate uh, with and so on. So um, it would be, um, for me, in that domain, in, in, in what I see these young people feeling as really uh, deep, deep pain. Um, and then coming from that angle, uh, as much as, you know, the parents' empathy with the child, of uh, wanting the child, the young person, to, to feel differently about themselves. Um, so, um, uh, note of optimism there, we can do it together, we, you know, we'll be able to manage this better than you can do on your own, uh, but also a note of understanding that it really is, is difficult and, and hard and something that you deserve uh, support with uh, and, I'm, uh, and I'm willing to give it to you. So that that's, would be my line. Thank you. And I think actually really listening to that, it kind of aligns with the timeline of what I've seen in myself and in others over and over again, you know. I mean, for me as a child, I had a lot of signs of perhaps mental distress, shall we say, and they were picked up on around the age of nine, ten-ish. Um, but not much really was done about it because I got an appointment, but the support wasn't quite right. I kind of, I suppose, panicked a bit and they let me go. Let me just leave the situation and not look back until it became a lot more serious a few years later. And so I guess this leads me to my second question, which would be, what would you say are some of the ways that we can gear this early support to someone who may not understand why they need the help maybe, and how we can gear it towards them so that it can be personalised to suit them so they can accept it and try and start to work with it. Um, perhaps, Peter, you could go first. 
I mean, it's it, this is a, 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 a lovely question. And uh, I have spent several years, I would say decades, trying to find the answer for it. And if I knew the answer, I would now reel it off and say, but you do this, 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 and this. Sadly, um, I, we are still, uh, but I am uh, struggling. Um, uh, I, I, there are a number of ways uh, that I think, uh, maybe I should give an anecdote first that but, but I mentioned to you before, you know, that when I was first offered therapy at the age of 16, uh, I said, no, thank you. Uh, uh, I don't think I need it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I think I really, really understand that where young people are coming from, um, this is a deeply shaming and stigmatizing experience, possibly, to be offered help uh, and support that you can't manage on your own, um, that, you know, unlike uh, others, you, you need uh, uh, a shrink or, or whatever it is. Um, uh, but um, in terms of how I then engage, um, uh, it's really, really important from my point of view um, uh, that you engage in a way um, that combines two uh, seemingly opposite uh, things in, in, in um, the young person's uh, life. One is something that's structured, um, that uh, is, um, uh, uh, has coherence, uh, that uh, we do together in, in a way that's planned and, uh, uh, and clear. And the second uh, aspect is that we, we do it um, in a way where we are both participants to a, the same process. That it's not a situation where, uh, like school, uh, where I tell you these are the tasks and these are the things to do today. Um, but it's something um, where uh, 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 I'm active, I'm actively engaged. Um, I uh, focus on uh, the experience of the young person. I'm curious, I inquire about it. Uh, uh, I want to properly understand it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, also um, uh, something where uh, that understanding creates a sense of trust in me, uh, not as a therapist, but just as a person who is genuinely and deeply concerned. Um, so on the one hand, it's something that's structured and that I know what I'm doing and I go from step one to step two to step three. And it's, that's, those steps are clear to both of us uh, or all of us with the family. And the other is where I am actually able to create an environment where I'm not the superior person, not the big therapist uh, coming, but I am there with them trying to sort out the complexities of their life and uh, their understanding of the world and the increasingly bewildering uh, interpersonal uh, social environment that, you know, it's really hard to understand that multimedia and, and, and complex, you know, and, and, and I would struggle with in, in their shoes. So it's, it's, a, it's um, those two elements, uh, a sense of being with them, but also a sense of uh, um, a frame that uh, is there for both of us. Thank you, Peter. And I do think I absolutely agree. It's so important to be able to feel like, especially with young people, because they will sniff out silliness. So, and just to be able to feel that you're not acting above them and in consequence over them and in punishment, because who wants to be punished for feeling vulnerable? Um, and Carla, I'd like to ask you the same question. So what could we do to engage people when they first come for an, uh, perhaps an earlier service? Yeah. 
Well, Peter beautifully described, uh, you know, the mentalizing stance that any good therapist takes in engaging a young person, you know, and I, I think uh, just to elaborate some of the things that he said, and I think the previous time the three of us talked, um, authenticity came up. Um, as, a, as a key word in working with people in general, but in, in young people in particular, they have an authenticity radar. And if you are not, um, if they, and, and remember that most young people come in a, in a position of mistrust already. Um, they did not decide to come to therapy in many cases. They were brought to therapy. Someone is making them go, um, you know, uh, you know, naming the elephant in the room that they don't necessarily want to be there um, is important and um, and engaging with them in an authentic in an authentic uh, authentic way so um you know uh, peter really talked very nicely about this um the work for with with adolescents earlier on i think peter also asked the question about earlier intervention you know and and there um as well as with adolescents, we really need to think about parents. Um, you know, I think a lot of the work pre-adolescence, the evidence-based practice pre-adolescence is very much focused on parenting skills and um, uh, improving uh, children's behavior, if you will, uh, in a way that I don't necessarily build, think uh, support the building of the personality structure that much, and I'm I'm hoping that we can see a shift in pre-adolescent work to a stronger relational um, focus. Um, so I think I think uh, there is work to be done in terms of pre-adolescent approaches to building personality development and supporting personality development. Um, in our evidence-based practice that goes beyond the kind of CBT skills that we are currently teaching parents and children. Um, at the moment, we're really looking at, at symptoms, manifestations, impulsivity, emotion regulation, manifestations of underlying personality functioning. And I hope that we can um, begin to support parents a little bit more in, in how to um, do what Peter described the therapist does with an adolescent um, in pre-adolescence for the parent and the child. And so I do think there's a, there's a little bit of um, work out there that, that does that, but I don't see much in, in the literature at the moment that, uh, that talks to parents about how do you support your child's personality development through relational approaches. So I hope we can see more of that because I think that's how we build the, or we, we put in place the building blocks for what's gonna happen in, in adolescence. I hope that made sense. Thank you. Um, and I think our next question is, um, as we've spoken about, you can see a lot of learning both for and from parents and those in the wider network of a young person especially at a formative age where you know someone's not necessarily either left to or able to kind of do things their own way there's a lot of learning to be done from those around them and so I was going to ask Peter first but I think I'll ask Carla first but I'll explain what I'm going to ask so Carla first of all I'm going to ask you if you could talk about what we can learn and what they can learn from us um, non-professionals in a young person circle so what the mutual learning there can be and then Peter I'll ask you in a minute what other non-mental health professionals so teachers can do to kind of learn from and we can learn from as well. So Carla first, please. So this is what we can learn from? I think a little bit of both. What we can learn from them and I suppose what they what they could try and learn as well. Is this the, the young persons themselves or the people around the, the people person? around them, sorry. The sorry. Well the, I think families for me have been incredibly um, uh, important you know, and I think it is because when when we, um, you know, and I have to give credit to to Perry Hoffman, who who really taught me a lot about the experience of families, 
of, um, uh, of people who um, have personality challenges. And, uh, and I think, you know, when I trained, um, all of our theory and research in understanding personality disorder really vilified the family and um, really um, painted a picture of the family as highly toxic, uh, as, ha as having um, uh, bad intentions, as being really cruel and abusive uh, in, in, many, in most cases uh, for, 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 uh, for those that, that end up developing personality disorder. And, and so I was trained in that way too. And I would, um, I would approach a family where someone has personality disorder with suspicion, um, trying to find, you know, um, uh, fault in, in what these parents did wrong, uh, you know, and, uh, and, you know, thank, thankfully I, I, I learned from families and I learned that um, families do the best they can. And um, in many cases, it's a very, very complex transaction that happens between, between parents and caregivers and, and children and siblings. We, we, we don't talk enough about siblings, but um, how all of these relationships evolve in a family and, and interact with someone's natural temperament and what they need from the context around them. And so, you know, I was very grateful to learn um, from families uh, and to see uh, families' um, uh, best best attempts to to map to to match a, a young person's needs and and failing, you know, trying to trying to do it and the intention is there but not always um, having the tools to do that. So, so for me, stepping back from that view of vilifying the family was really an important um, step. And um, uh, and partnering with the family, uh, Peter talked about um, the the partnership between the young person and the therapist. But equally, it's a very very important partnership between the therapist and the family members um, to really uh, look at, from a systemic point of view at, at at supporting a young person's personality development. So yeah, families are critical. Um, they are going to. Give, give us the most important information about steps forward to create the kind of environment where a young person can flourish. Thank you, Carla. And Peter, I suppose you've got the slightly more complex question because it's a step further back, which would be um, non-family non and friends, but other professionals that do not work in mental health, so people like teachers, school nurses. What can we learn from them and what can they learn from us, I'm wondering? I mean, it's again, uh, but it's a really good question. And um, as I got older, um, uh, which happened without me noticing, really, uh, uh, but um, uh, as I got older, I kind of uh, developed something that uh, uh, a quality called humility uh, that um, I realized that actually. Uh, Youth workers, teachers, assistant teachers, you know, uh, that human beings actually were really good at this. Uh, and um, uh, believe it or not, sometimes they were better than therapists uh, because they didn't actually get so muddled and confused with what they professionally were taught. Uh, for example, the, the excellent example that Carla mentions is to place the uh, <clears throat> emphasis on where there must be a pathological family behind this child because they are so you know if you don't have these expectations actually you sometimes do the right thing uh, because you don't have preconceptions um, but not just naivete people are incredibly talented in relating to other human beings some people are incredibly talented to do mischief uh, with other human beings, uh, which you have to protect children from, and you have to protect young people from. So you have to be aware of both sides of humanity uh, in this. It's not just that everybody is a good person. Uh, you can't assume that. You have to safeguard. But what I've found is that actually enabling a young person to trust more those around them is as important uh, 
a driver of their improvement and their growth as an individual as uh, the therapy. And in fact, it's more. Uh, in particular, uh, I want to emphasize that young people have an orientation towards other young people, uh, making other young people incredibly influential in their lives. Um, and working, uh, learning from and teaching the culture, the context in which that young person is, is perhaps more important or as important as what happens just between them and, uh, and I in, or even the family uh, and uh, I in the consulting room. So that um, the benefit may come from being able to change the young person's attitude to uh, uh, gradually be more trusting and having more allowing uh, young people to influence them more, allowing teachers to influence them more, and then just letting that happen uh, without me actually interfering too much. Uh, that is, as long as I protect the young person, that I do not forget uh, that it is my responsibility, my duty of care to make sure that uh, actually uh, uh, they are in a, in a, in a benign, uh, as opposed to a malign social environment. But benign social environments, be this friends, uh, teachers, you know, football clubs, uh, whatever, are actually where the cure takes place, uh, not in the consulting room. Uh, now, as I said, this humility only came to me late in life. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but up till then, I thought I was the most important thing. Uh, but now I tend to feel, well, maybe not. When young people tell me that they're feeling better, and I ask why, they very rarely tell me, yeah, because Dr. Fonagy, you said all those wonderful things to me. They most often say, but I've got this new girlfriend, I've got this new boyfriend, I've got this new friend, I've got, you know, a, a teacher that's been lovely to me, you know. They say that my social world has changed. Uh, and uh, I don't have to totally excuse myself in that sense. I can say, well, I was very important in making them change their feelings about their social world. So I'm still responsible. <laughs> I'm still responsible. I'm not irrelevant. But actually, what was more relevant than me uh, was the social world. But it's important that I do not relinquish my responsibility. It is up to me to make sure that they are oriented towards an appropriate social group uh, and I protect them from malign groups. Thank you, Peter. And I think it's something that we kind of have, well, I personally think about a lot, which is the fact that generally speaking, you might be in a therapy room or a doctor's room an hour a week, if you, unless you're in a very, very intensive program. And you spend the other, I don't know how many other hours there are in the week, but you spend the rest of them out in the real world um, with other people. Not that therapists aren't real people, but with the people that you're going to spend most of your life with, hopefully. <laughs> um, so, so why did it take me so long to recognise this? <laughs> it's so obvious to you like this. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, and we've got a couple more questions, so I'm going to try and whiz through them now. I do apologise. But um, the next question is, um, obviously, it's these recordings are for BPD Awareness Month, Borderline Personality Disorder Awareness Month. Um, and while we've spoken a little bit about that, I don't think I've geared my questions towards that yet. And so I suppose this question is going to be, what would you say are some of the best things we can do to help young people who might be starting to struggle with symptoms that we would kind of look at and go, ah, oh, that might be associated with a personality problem or that might turn into something. And actually I'm gonna be a bit cheeky and give mine first from my lived experience, which is going to be simply that I need transparent conversations. We need transparent conversations and to be empowered with knowledge so that we can understand ourselves and make that progress. If you can't understand yourself and what's going on for you, how are you going to change it? 
Um, but yeah, maybe Carla, if I could ask you to give me one thing on that theme. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, I love what you said. I think um, that's, uh, you know, Peter said earlier on and, and so nicely described the subjective experience of being a young, you know, a teenager and 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 how how one uh, in my experience, I've got a 14 year old myself and I, you know, the, the feeling of not. Um, knowing what you like, not knowing and, and, you know, not wanting to be boxed in at the same time by someone telling you what you like, you know, you really want to have that freedom. So, so giving young people the, sp the space to take up their space, if that makes sense, um, you know, to really, um, to really uh, exp explore who they are and, and, uh, but give enough, be, being given enough um, support to do that in a safe way. So, you know, it, it is the old balance between, um, between agency and, and, and support. So uh, I think that's what, uh, what young people need uh, most in, in navigating adolescents most successfully. Thank you. And Peter? Um, you know, I, I would start always by sharing my own experience of adolescence and just... Um, uh, you know, describing my experience and, and, and seeing if anything rings a bell for them uh, in that. Um, um, uh, and marvel when they say, nah, that's not a problem for me. I said, really not a problem for you? It was such a problem for me. Or uh, they say, yeah, that wasn't a problem, but this is a problem. And then, you know, align with that. So, um, uh, in terms of the knowledge that I would give them, some of that knowledge would come um, not from textbooks, from, but from human experience. My experience over the years of with other young people and, and also uh, with myself. Um, uh, and uh, uh, normalizing, I think, is so important, uh, particularly for, 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 for people who are as you say, is showing early signs of pervasive uh, problems that could become persistent. Uh, and then you normalize it, and then you offer the, you know, uh, hope that actually uh, it's a problem, but it doesn't have to be a problem. Uh, and you offer hope. Um, uh, so um, uh, one of Carla's big discoveries in this field, and I'm surprised she hasn't mentioned it, is that many young people like me, uh, when I was, you know, 15, 16, I used to overthink things and over get over involved. Uh, and I was haughty and dismissing and uh, uh, because I knew better and so on. And being able to share that uh, with young people say, you know, you know, you can think too much. Uh, and uh, maybe one of the things that might help is thinking a little bit less uh, rather than more. So why don't you come to a shrink and then we can together practice thinking less uh, or something, you know, do you see what I'm getting at? So it's uh, hooking in uh, through partly my knowledge of the literature, but mainly uh, my self-experience um, making it human uh, and, and, and tangible. Thank you, Peter. Um, and I suppose our last question really quickly is going to be, um, what advice would you have for young people and their families who are kind of discovering that they might need to be their own advocate right now? Um, what advice would you offer to say, perhaps a few words of encouragement? And I think what I'd say is simply that seeking help is not weakness and it is not shameful. Seeking help is the complete opposite and it will get you very far in life if you know how to say, can I have a bit of support with this right now? Um, so, Peter, what would you say? I, I would agree with you, Maddie. I think, um, uh, as I said, you know, I turned down the offer of help that I had immediately um, uh, and it took me you know, another six to eight months before I kind of worked through it and accepted it. Um, I think part of it is the way that help is offered. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, you, 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 we have to take responsibility as, as professionals or as experts by occupation uh, that 
we offer help in the wrong way that belittles people rather than empowers them. Um, but uh, uh, it's um, really important uh, to seek help early and to create what Carla is trying to do, uh, a more responsive understanding uh, system for offering preventive uh, help in a, a, a way that's acceptable, uh, but also in this country, certainly, um, that is actually available uh, because oftentimes young people ricochet around the system um, in a, what called sub-threshold uh, presentations. And we know that the same things that work for people who are above the threshold also work sub-threshold. So why don't we delay? Why do we delay offering help? Uh, that's that's the ambition for me. Thank you, Peter and Carla. Any final yeah, closing? I, I wanted to say, you know, what naturally came up for me. What I want to say to parents and, and young people is trust. Trust me. You know, I, you know, I'm going to do my best uh, to help. But um, I guess uh, I don't know who's going to look uh, at this uh, recording, but. Um, you know, the to the mental health professionals out there, um, uh, you know, I, I do think Peter is spot on that we sometimes lose sight as mental health professionals of the of relating to 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 families and young people as humans first, and as therapists second. L let's put aside the evidence based practice that that's ingrained in us. We can it'll be there. It'll come out. And, and, and put the human part of us first in, in relating to other people. Um, that is how we are going to make good on the, the request for help. So yes, uh, please families and, and, and young people ask for help and, and health professionals, please relate first and foremost as a human being to a family and a client. That is the way that we're gonna bridge this, this gap that people fall, fall in the whole time. Thank you. And thank you both. Uh, thanks for joining me in this discussion. And just a reminder for those who are tuning into view, listen. Um, I don't know if it's just listening, but if it is, you know, enjoy our voices. If it's viewing, enjoy our faces. But please do tune into A Tale of Three Cities Goes Global this May and have a lovely rest of your day after watching this, I suppose. Thanks. Thank you, Maddie. Thanks, Maddie.